program for the performing arts. Crescendo is a production of international artists in New York City and Seattle, Washington. Thank you for joining us. On our show today, we have something very, very special for you. We are taking a theater organ that was built in the 70s with all analog parts, similar to your transistor radios of those days. And we're going to completely rebuild it. All of the old wiring is going to have to come out. All of the old parts are going to have to come out. I'm actually right now standing in front of the finished product of this lovely theater organ that now has the digital recording sounds of the mighty Wurlitzer Theater Pipe Organ. We're going to begin by showing you what the inside of this organ looked like when it first arrived in our shops, and then we're going to take you through the rebuilding process, one step at a time. Back in the 60s and 70s, the Kahn Organ Company made one of the very finest theater organs that money could buy at that time. Technology has advanced tremendously since that time, so we're going to take just a moment and show you what this organ sounds like right now, and then we're going to go through a whole series of things to completely gut this organ of all of its electronics and put in new modern up-to-date digital electronics, and then we'll show you what the difference sounds like when we finish. First of all, here's the con organ as it sits today, just as it was built in the 60s and 70s. <laughs> Let's listen to just a few of the individual sounds. Here is the tibia, which is the soul of all theater organs. And the vox humana. Back in those days, one of the most difficult things to reproduce were the big reeds of a real pipe organ. Here is the way they did a tuba. And here's the big post horn. When the whole organ was played together, it certainly made a respectable sound. But after we finish doing our work, you'll be shocked at the difference. It'll sound like a real theater pipe organ then. <laughs> The first thing that Dave needs to do is remove the old speakers from the console because we are no longer going to be using the old speakers. They'll all be external. What we're doing presently is ripping out all of the old wiring and cables and computer parts. The trash can is already full of old computer boards. Okay, ripping cables apart is kind of fun. You just chop away. We'll have a lot of trash to throw away when we get finished with this job. After removing all the computer boards from the back of the console, they now open the lid, and you can see all the computer boards for the keyboards and the stops above. All these have to be removed and thrown away because they will no longer be used in the console. Now here you can see where David has completely removed all the computer boards. He is now removing some of the wires, which are unnecessary. 
And then once all the wires are cut out, the whole area needs to be cleared out because this space will now be used for the new input boards. Now the keyboards have been removed and Dave is soldering new wiring onto the contacts. Those little blue things that you see up along there are the contact controls from each key. They touch a little wire that completes the circuit and allows the key to play. Now here you can see as I press the keys, you can see these blue rods moving which move the wires which make the contact onto the rod on the left side. Now that the keyboard has been all rewired, it is put back into the console as you can see here. All the wires are connected and the keyboard is ready to be wired into these driver boards that you see in the back. Now each key has to go into one of these holes in the driver boards in order for contact to be made so that the organ can play properly. Now the stops also must be wired into driver boards. And you will notice that each stop has a wire that goes into the driver board and there is one wire between all the stops that's a common that goes also into the driver board. All right, this part of working on the organ is the engraving. This is the engraving machine. This is the computer that I run it with. And here's I put in the text for the, uh, the stop that we are engraving. And then I send this to the engraver, which is here. I've got a tab stop, which I put in the engraver here. And then I tell it to engrave it. Now that the stop has been engraved, you can't see the engraving very well unless you're up close. So what we have to do is take this lacquer stick and I have to fill it, wipe it off, and that will leave this black lacquer inside so that you can read the stop. Let me show you. So first, I will take the black lacquer and fill it, which makes quite a mess. And then once that's filled, you have to wipe that off. All the excess. What you're left with is a readable tab stop. Here you see an entire group of completed tab stops, red with white lettering and white with black lettering. And now that we have completed engraving the tabs and filled it, we will now put it into the stop rail. Now Mark has to insert it into the rail and there is a spring in the back which he is going to have to grab a tool and adjust. And we're attaching the spring that will make the stop actuate and work. The stops that you just saw Lynn engrave have now been mounted onto a second stop rail and we're getting ready to mount the second stop rail under the first stop rail because this organ has a double row of stops. Each one of the rows of stop tabs has a computer interface board that they are wired into with all of these multicolored wires. This is the interface board that goes to the second row of stops that we just mounted. So now we're going to mount the interface board permanently onto the backdrop and wire them together. Here is the actual brain center of our newly renovated organ. These are the computer boards that we 
put programs into to connect all of those boards that we wired to the keyboards and the stop switches and the pedal board. And to tie all of that together, we need an actual computer program written for just this organ. And now we're going to see Lynn sitting at the computer and actually writing the program that's going to make this organ play and the whole system run together. Once the program is completed and compiled, it is installed into this Mac computer, which is connected to the control system with a MIDI cable. The computer holds the Artisan Sound Engine software to reproduce the true pipe organ ranks. Now the few remaining things left to do is screw the lid back onto the console and then lower the lid into place and start testing the stops, the keyboards, and the sounds to make sure they are all playing properly. Okay. Here we go. And now comes a very important part. It's called the voicing, where you have to test the sounds and change the pitch and change the volume to match the place where the organ will be played. And this completes about a good week and a half worth of work on the organ. Now that we've done all of that work and replaced all of the parts, this organ that was an electronic organ made by the Kahn Organ Company of Elkhart, Indiana, is now a completely digital instrument with all of the recorded sounds of the mighty Wurlitzer Theater pipe organ. Now, theater organs vary greatly from church organs. First of all, the stop tabs are arranged in a horseshoe shape. That's because there's a lot more stops on a theater organ than there is on a church organ. And you want to be able to swing your arms around and reach any stop very comfortably from where you're seated. Also, since theater organs were meant to accompany silent motion pictures back in the 20s, they had to have all kinds of sound effects. Things like a well, Chinese gong. Or a bird whistle. Even a crash symbol. If it's at Christmas, we might need a movie that has sleigh bells in it. The possibilities are just almost limitless. Theater organs also have some other wonderful stops on them. I'll show you those now. The heart and soul of the theater organ is the tibia clausa. It's a stop that has a wonderful sobbing sound to it, and it really brings out the melody in almost anything you play. Now, earlier in the show, we showed you how the tibia on this organ sounded originally. now is the digital recreation of the real Mighty Wurlitzer Tibia. You can hear it breathe. Those chromatic runs that I was playing are called theater organ glissandos, and that style of playing was invented by probably the greatest theater organist who ever lived, a man by the name of Jesse Crawford. Jesse played at the New York Paramount in the wonderful big Wurlitzer theater organ there for many years, and his style earned him the name the Poet of the Organ. He used the tibias, the vox humanas, and a lot of the beautiful reeds of the organ to great, great effect. We're going to hear the solo tuba now, and some of these Jesse Crawford styled registrations in a piece written in the 30s by George Gershwin called Our Love is Here to Stay.
The fire and pizzazz of a theater organ comes from its trumpets, its tubas, and its English post horn. You heard what the English post horn on this organ sounded like before. That was about the best they could muster back in the early 70s and late 60s when organs like this were being built. But a real Wurlitzer English post horn has a lot more body and a lot more fire. Here's the digital post horn from a real Wurlitzer pipe now. <laughs> can really hear the fire in that. We're going to hear a number right now called What Are You Waiting For, Mary? that was written in 1924, and it's going to make use of the post horn and a lot of the big theater organ sounds. <laughs>
In addition to the normal type sounds that you have on any pipe organ, theater organs also have percussions, just like a marching band or a symphony orchestra. Here's a glockenspiel. Or an orchestra bell. For those sultry nights that you might want a Latin American piece, we have a marimba. Imagine the marimba being used along with some other tambourines, the Chinese gong, and the bird whistle to give us this lovely little quiet village sound. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Crescendo. We hope to see you next time.